Okay, armchair quarterbacks, and those of you that know that this is a football and not much else, it's time to learn a little more about football. Welcome to the Massachusetts School of Law Educational Forum. Come along with us as we look at the NFL behind the scenes. Let's start with something we know, the players. To help us with that is Matthew Slater. Matthew is a captain of the New England Patriots, and during my research on Matthew, I found a Wikipedia reference that said in addition to being a Pro Bowl football player and son of NFL Hall of Famer Jackie Slater, that he was the world's greatest rock climber. For real? You didn't know did, that did about you, me. Did you write that yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you, uh, are you a great rock climber? Because that's something I didn't know. I doubt most people did. I can't take credit for that. I'm not a good rock climber. No? I maybe have been rock climbing twice in my life on the little artificial ones. So, so someone just filled the Wikipedia Somebody has, out. has given some false information there. What's it like to be a gunner on a football team? Because it's a great name. It is. It is a great name. Uh, you know, it's something that is very challenging. Oftentimes, it's a two-on-one street fight. That's how I like to explain it. Uh, but it's something that I really enjoy doing. I have a lot of fun. Uh, the competitor in me uh, just just loves the opportunity to go out there and, and go against two guys. And, and you're obviously very good at it. You're an all-pro on uh, as a special teamer, and you're a captain of the Patriots. Uh, tell me about your transition from college to the pro game. You know, it, it was a difficult one. Um, obviously, for me, I grew up in Southern California, and as a 22-year-old young man, I have to move across the country to to Boston, to the Boston area. Uh, so that was a big adjustment. And then obviously the game, the game is very different at this level. The speed of the game, the intellect of the game, uh, it's a totally different game than the college game. So I had my growing pains along the way, but uh, I've been fortunate enough to have some good people around me, great coaches, great teammates over the years, and I've survived up until this point. And as one of the few children of an NFL Hall of Famer, what's it like to have to fill those shoes? Because that has to be pretty big footsteps you follow in. You know, it's been challenging at times. Uh, fortunately for me, my father has made that easy. You know, he's never put pressure on me to, to be like him. He actually didn't want me playing football because he didn't want me getting hurt. But he's been very supportive of my career. He's been very, you know, just uh, complimentary along the way and one of my biggest fans. And he's really taken a step back and he's enjoyed being the role of Matthew's dad as opposed to Jackie Slater. So I, I really appreciate that. How hard has it been to actually make it in the NFL? I mean, most of us see the pro football players as these huge mammoth guys, and you're not that big, but you're obviously fast and tough, and you have a lot of other components. How, how hard was it to make it in the NFL? You know, it's been very difficult. Uh, these are some of the best athletes in the world sure. that you go against, some of the best coaches uh, in the world that you're facing week in, week out. So there are challenges that present themselves every day. Um, and like I said, I really feel like I've had great people around me. Um, I really feel like my faith in God has helped me a lot. And, uh, you know, I've just been really blessed to get to this point. It's not all me and my doing. Uh, it's, uh, it's a group effort. It really is. And the challenges aren't just on the football field or in preparation for it, but it's all the other security issues and personal issues that are attached to it as well. How does the NFL help you um, face some of those other issues that come off the field for people with fame and fortune of being a professional football player. Well, you hit it on the head. There are a lot of issues that you face. Uh, it's more, unfortunately, than just playing football. Um, but we have a league uh, that has really gone out of its way to um, try to protect the players from some of the dangers out there. You know, we have uh, our player engagement director, uh, Kevin Anderson, does a great job of educating the young players as far as what to expect, uh, what comes along with, uh, a big paycheck, what comes along with fame and attention, um, and trying to be disciplined in certain areas of your life. So the NFL, you know, they have a number of programs out there, starting with the symposium when you come in, that try to educate the players of, you know, these are some of the hazards, some of the obstacles that you may face, and, um, and here's how you can defeat those, and uh, I think they do a great job of that. Um, what it was the hardest part off the field in transitioning from uh, the college game to the pro game with respect to all the multitude of distractions that must come with being a pro athlete. Right. I think for me it was uh, learning how to say no. Um, you're asked to do so many different things. Um, you're asked maybe to borrow money, if you want to borrow money, appearances, and you have to learn how to say no. Um, and for me that was a tough thing because I, you know, I don't want to be seen as a rude guy or a guy that's not willing to help out, but there's just so many demands on your plate that you, you have to pick and choose which ones are important to you, which ones 
you can do without you know conflicting with your football schedule. Um, and once you find that balance, I think you'll be able to have some success from there. But finding that balance of when to say no and yes is big. What educational services have you taken advantage of uh, since entering the league with respect to uh, what the NFL uh, provides for the various boot camps and um, training for um, people to start to not make that transition just yet? We can get to that. <laughs> uh, but what educational services have you taken advantage of? Well, I think there have been a number of them, starting, as I said, uh, with the symposium coming into the league. And I've always been a guy that's tried to maintain a relationship with our player engagement director. Uh, I'm also a member of our union, so I've really been able to learn a lot from that side of things, uh, being involved in the union and being involved with uh, some of the decision making that goes on behind the scenes. Um, you know, I've also participated in the Rookie Symposium as a speaker um, and trying to educate some of those young guys. So uh, I think for me, just being involved, being aware of what was going on around me was important as opposed to just uh, letting things go on that I had no clue. Uh, I think just educating myself uh, through involvement was important. Uh, let's talk about the union for a minute. You've been a player rep for, uh, with, the, with the union as well? Yes, sir. How active is the union in trying to ensure that the players receive the, the benefits they're entitled to and the services they need through the various programs that the NFL provides? Uh, that's really their, their top priority. They want to make sure that our players get fair treatment, that our players are educated as far as what's available to them, um, post-career, during their career, um, and they really went out of their way during our last negotiation to ensure that the players were getting, you know, taken care of, so to speak, as far as benefits are concerned, as far as health and safety is concerned, as far as uh, even uh, continuing uh, education post-career. So uh, the union, their number one priority is, is taking care of our players uh, on and off the football field, and, and I think they do a great job of that. You know, we hear of the, the fights between the union and the NFL at times when it blows up, but how closely do they work together to benefit the players? Listen, that's, that's part of it. That's part of labor relations. Sure. Those things are going to happen, um, you know, with business. So we all understand that. And uh, really, it wouldn't have gotten done if cooler heads hadn't prevailed. So cooler heads prevailed. Uh, we were able to come together. We had some great leadership on both sides of the fence that, uh, that made things happen and, and has our game as successful as it's ever been now. Mm -hmm. What advice do you give when you participate in the symposia for the new players? What advice do you have that uh, to help ease their transition? I think the biggest thing as a new player is first things first, focus on football. Because if you're not taking care of your business on the football field, you're not going to be around very long. Um, and then from there, I think learning to balance your finances and, and how you spend is big. You hear the horror stories of guys that have uh, blown away fortunes, and, and some of that is, is not all their fault. Uh, you have to be wise in your decision making. You have to be careful. You have to do your due diligence when it comes to certain things, and I think that's what I try to encourage young guys. You know, When you leave this game, you'd like to be able to have something to show for it. We have a tremendous opportunity. It's the best part-time job you'll ever have as far as giving yourself a head start into life and into your next career. Does the NFL provide uh, benefits with respect to financial education for players with respect to how they should invest, how they should spend, and how they should think about what happens after their days on the field are over? Uh, no question. And I, again, I'll go back to our, our player engagement director, Kevin Anderson, and what, uh, what you do as a rookie is you have pretty much meetings year-round, and these meetings educate you in a number of different fields, but a big one is the finance field because it's such a big issue for our young players. Um, and they have us speak with financial advisors, planners, et cetera, as far as decision making when it comes to your money. Um, the NFL and the union have uh, financial advisors that they've approved of that they will refer to guys. So uh, they really do a great job of making sure that you know, young men, we know this is a big responsibility upon you, but we're going to try to do everything we can to help you be successful in managing those finances. If uh, one of your players is uh, having issues or you become aware that they're having issues, are there, is there advice you give them or do you give them direction or uh, is there someone else that they could turn to with respect to the, whatever it is that they may be experiencing, whether it's finances or mm -hmm. otherwise? I think it all depends on the situation and your relationship with that player. Some guys you may sit down and talk to and, and kind of share your experience. Some guys you may refer to uh, 
uh, Kevin Anderson again mm -hmm. and, and some of the players and, and outlets that we have as far as our league. So it just depends on, you know, who the guy is, what the situation is. But there are a number of different um, courses of action that you can take when those situations arise. If you had to uh, experience the transition over again, what, what would you do differently than you did um, at, in 2008 or 9 when you entered the league? Um, wow, that's a good question. I had to learn the hard way to, to say no. I'll go back to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I really tried to do too much, I think, early on. I really um, could have done a better job of balancing my priorities and, and deciding what was important to me. Um, but some of that you have to learn through experience. And uh, I learned that fortunately, and I've been able to clean some of those areas up. Do you have uh, safety or security issues that, uh, for your own family, uh, those close to you, um, that come as a result of being a professional football play player with uh, the New England Patriots? You know, fortunately, I haven't. And we have a great director of security here that whenever an issue arises, we can run it by him. He's always available. Uh, with sound advice and I know guys have had personal security when they've gone out but fortunately I've never had a, an issue here in New England I've never had an issue back in my hometown in Southern California and I think a lot of that comes down to decision making uh, the people you hang around uh, the places you go um, all that factors into you know you being safe as an NFL player well, does the social media play a, an additional risk that uh, didn't take place during your dad's time that you have to be especially aware of the dangers and risks that are attached to that? No question. I think a whole different set of problems come along with the social media. Um, obviously, they can be used for, for great things, for getting a positive message out there, for promoting your brand. But I think you have to be really cautious about you know, what you put out there, what information you give. Me personally, I don't have any social media, but I know that a lot of my teammates do. Um, and it's all how you use it. Uh, it can be used to do, like I said, great things but you just have to be sound in your decision making when it comes to that. What services does the NFL provide for players to start to think about the transition from uh, being a professional football player to the next uh, decade of their life and their professional careers? Well, there are a number of programs that they have uh, during the off season where you can intern or job shadow. Um, I think you mentioned earlier broadcast boot camp. That's one of them. Um, and there are a number of programs where you can continue your education. They have uh, continued education programs that they've offered at Harvard and Stanford where you can go in there for a period of time and, and take some advanced courses. So they always are, are operating within a long-term vision, understanding that the average NFL career is only 3.1 years. You have to be ready to transition at any point. And I think they do a good job of, of having those resources there for us, you know, allowing us to get some unique experience as far as the job shadowing and things like that. Um, and operating, you know, with, with the thought of, hey, you know, I'm only going to be doing this for a short period of time. Um, you know, I got to be ready to move on at some point. I saw a music boot camp, a Hollywood boot camp, a franchise boot camp, uh, the ones you mentioned as well. What's, what's the next chapter of Matthew Slater's life when uh, football's over? Well, you know, I've always had a passion for ministry. I've always uh, enjoyed working with the young people. Um, and, you know, I, I think I like to be involved in full-time ministry in some capacity, whether it's with young people, whether it's counseling or whatnot. That's something that, that I really hold dear, and that's my faith, and that's kind of the filter through which I make all my decisions. So, so hopefully, Lord willing, I play a few more years before I have to make that decision, but uh, that's what I think I want to do after football's over with. Well, that's amazing. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you very much. So are you going to stay in this area? Will you return to Southern California? Or where would you likely do that type of work? You know, that remains to be seen. Uh, you know, I've, I've really grown fond of this area, being here six years now. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't think I'd ever say that with the weather the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, I've been able to have some great relationships and meet some really great people out here. So, so we'll see. When you're ready to make a difference in the world, one law school can make a difference for you. The Massachusetts School of Law is where you learn to become a lawyer. As the most affordable law school in New England, you'll graduate with the most professional skills and the least amount of debt. 
Our small classes ensure a rich learning experience and a campus environment so special, our students don't want to leave. The Massachusetts School of Law, we're ready to make a difference for you. Visit us today at mslaw.edu. As you may think, there aren't a lot of women involved in the NFL. Yes, I know you know about the cheerleaders, who work enormously hard to promote the NFL. Our trial team members met some of the Patriots cheerleaders at the airport in San Francisco, while the cheerleaders were on their way to China to promote the Patriots and the NFL brand. But what about those women who work behind the scenes? One of those talented women is attorney Dina Garner. She was a prosecutor in Indianapolis, Indiana, worked with the NCAA for many years, and then moved to the NFL security office. Dina now works in the player engagement office of the NFL. How do they help the players? So we're a service department. So we assist these young men with their entire experience, whether they are at the high school level and understanding fundamentals. We have camps and clinics. We also have leadership development programs to assist not only football student athletes, but also athletes um, at the high school and, and uh, uh, collegiate level in becoming good people and, and being leaders and using their athleticism plus their academics to be you know, successful in life because I do believe that sports can assist people in a lot of ways to be better prepared for some of the hardships that life you, know, you might have to face. And when you play team sports, it definitely helps when you're able to be a part of a team. So through our department, we try to make sure that the young people's experience and then those who can and do make it to the NFL, that it's seamless, that they have great information um, prior to coming, and then while they're in the National Football League as active NFL players, that they understand the breadth of what is available to them in the way of resources and services so that they can successfully transition. And then for former players or legends, we still assist them because they're still part of the family. So we want to make sure that their journey and their transition is as fulfilling as it can be. Let's talk about the different educational services because I wasn't aware that at the high school and college level, the NFL does provide education services, mm -hmm. and not just to the male athletes, but right. to females as well. What services do they provide to that audience? Sure, so we have a, we have a few programs. The, our prep platform is, is where we really concentrate our outreach um, efforts on high school and college leadership development. We have a program called the Leadership Prep 100 Series, which is basically a one-day, half-day clinic, um, football skills and drills. The target audience um, is, is high school football student athletes. On the, they're mostly all male student athletes. And then the other half of the time of that particular program is spent in the classroom. Um, with them, their parents and their athletic administrators, their coaches, and explaining to them and partnering with the National Collegiate Athletic Association so that they understand the initial eligibility rules and requirements so that they can become academically successful as well as still be able to participate in sport as a student athlete um, in, while in college. And then we have former players and active player engagement directors and active players who participate on a panel to talk with them about leadership and to talk with them about transition. And it's never too early in our, in our realm that we work in. We feel that it's never too early to understand that transition applies in various aspects of your life. So it's very appropriate for us to give that type of transition discussion to not only the student athletes, um, but also their parents and their guardians and the administrators. And then we have other programs for um, high school student athletes that um, ac address a cross, you know, cross specter of people. Mm -hmm and we have females that are involved in that. And it's a one-day um, program called a Career in uh, Sports Exposition. And it's a one-day program that we have around the draft and the Super Bowl, where we show and expose the young people that participate in the geographic region where the draft or the um, Super Bowl is being hosted. So we work with a nonprofit agency to um, basically canvas the area where the event is going to take place. And we have a series of panels where we have active and former players as well as other athletics administrators from the college side to the professional side. And really the goal is to expose these young people while they're still in high school about the opportunities that sports will afford people so that they're not just locked in, oh, I want to be, you know, in the NBA and I'm, you know, I want to go to school one year and then I want to be in the NBA or I want to come into the NFL and they're only focused on 
playing when in actuality they don't probably have much of a frame of reference about what is all involved in sports. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been really interesting. Yeah, the NFL prep uh, focuses on six core areas. It mm -hmm. says uh, academic excellence, right. uh, financial literacy, mm -hmm. character development, conflict resolution, communication, and then health, safety, and wellness. Yes. And that extends both for the uh, students in high school and college, then the new um, entrance into the NFL, and then even as folks start to transition to their next careers. That's correct. Uh, the NFL provides education in all those areas mm -hmm. to all those different groups. Correct, as well as to the spouses and significant mm -hmm. others. For active players and former players, we have what we call transition assistance programs for former players or the legends where we really assist them with, you know, you, you're not just physically transitioning off the field into mainstream life, but you are transitioning in all aspects of that. So we, we work with them and have people that are experts in dealing with the physical, the emotional, um, psychological, um, the full specter of everything that you experience as you transition from one field of life into the next. And we also feel it's very important because most of these men are mature at that time, and we feel it's very important for their significant others to be a part of that process. So spouses um, are also invited to partake of those programs that we have available. How frequently do players uh, and their spouses and significant others take advantage of the services? I'd say often, but certainly not as often as, I mean, I can tell you that 100% um, is, is uh, achieved, but we certainly have um, great, um, made some great inroads, and I think it's in part, I know it's in part because of the staff, and again, our department is a service department, and also the fact that the league is committed, and so we have five former players that actually work in the department and work in various aspects of the league, which is extremely helpful because they have a core network of their peers that they communicate with on a regular basis, many of whom have already transitioned, who may not call me and say, hey, Dina, I have some concerns about you know, this, the transition issue that I'm dealing with, but they may call James Thrash, or they may call Dwight Hollier, they may call David Tyree, they may call Patrick Kearney, or quite, you know, may, oftentimes they call Troy Vincent. So it's wonderful to have these former or legends that I work alongside with that are funneling the communication so that we can assist these people and these men and their families as they go through life. And because of their fame and perceived fortune, they're relatively easy targets for mm -hmm. those that would want to prey on right. uh, people to try and take advantage of them. What services does the NFL provide to try and help make sure that they're aware of the dangers sure. of, of their status? Sure. We have some wonderful programs. Our security department is bar none, um, a phenomenal group of people, and they are dedicated to making sure that not only the players, but the players and their families are well taken of um, and cared for, and if they're going to invest a dollar in hiring a nanny or a contractor or investing any money, we go out and we communicate with them. When I say we, our department, as well as the security department talks to all 32 clubs. We talk to the players, we talk to the coaches, we talk to the administration to let them know about the robust services. So basically the, the, the spectrum of the services entails business background checks, um, due diligence background checks, home security surveys, um, where uh, the security professional will come to your residence and do an assessment of what the structure that you have should look like from a security perspective and then gives you basically all of this information in writing and then it's up to you as the homeowner to determine what you feel most comfortable with but that whole assessment is free of charge. All of the security services that are offered from the NFL are free of charge um, because we care and because the league cares and is committed to making sure that as you said, the, the men and their families are not preyed upon. We have robust services that assist players and club personnel, key club personnel, and including coaches and their families, especially during the off season. So when they're not in the building as we are today, and they're traveling with their families, if they're going to go outside of the United States, we have international security travel assistance where we can give the, um, the State Department alerts. We can give contacts in a different venue so that people will know before you know players or the head coach is going to be traveling to a specific venue in the event that something happens then they've already had those um, those pre-checks um, communicated in an effective way we also have programs where we assist um, our players as well as club personnel with social media and the NFL has rules with respect to uh, how much before games and right. the like that players can interact yes. with social media as yes. well. Yes, that's correct. There is a whole social media component that is communicated to the players 
to their family by our PR department. And then there is um, every year there is a presentation that is then put together in a video that's sent out to all 32 teams. And then um, there's mandatory like communications training that the PR rep de uh, department representatives communicate to the players and work with them in a proactive way and explain to them, here's how you can work very cooperatively with the media. Here's how you can be mindful of you know, your communication style as well as your obligation and make sure you're meeting your obligation and then just be careful of some of these other areas of concern. So they'll work directly with players offline as well as working directly with them um, as it relates to their specific responsibilities. So since the career of an NFL player is a relatively short one as a professional football player, how does the NFL help uh, players transition to the next part of their professional mm -hmm. lives? Well, while they're actively playing, we have a series of mandatory programs as well as other programs to assist with the transition. So the first, I'll just start with the mandatory. So we, for the drafted players, every um, June, we have what we call the Rookie Symposium and it's for all of the drafted rookies to attend. And it's basically a three and a half day life skills summit where there are um, different panel discussions about policy, um, players who lost their money, players who had some challenges transitioning, players who have successfully transitioned. And we feel as though our model is using peer-to-peer -peer communication because um, you can live it, you can see it when the person that's communicating with you has experienced what you are already experiencing, maybe not to the same level. Um, and then we partner that with other, uh, obviously, professionals um, who might not be players. Um, and then during the um, off season, there are mandatory programs that the security department goes out and communicates to the teams, to the full teams of players as well as um, coaches and other administrators. And then during the season, the, uh, there are mandatory programs uh, for the rookies. There is basically a nine-week um, continuation of the life skills training to assist them in you know, acclimatizing them to, you're not in college, you're now a professional. As a professional, there are new programs that you, Mr. New Professional, need to be aware of. So assisting them with financial uh, wellness and safety, um, as well as what you might think is a bit mundane. So you have a person maybe that has, um, is from the West Coast that now is gonna be a player with the New England Patriots. Some things that we have built into the programming, like helping this young man understand you have to get your driver's license changed over because you're working now. You're living in another state that requires, you know, you to be a registered, have a registered driver's license if you're driving a vehicle. Um, making sure that they understand um, how to deal with differences in climate and how that affects your car. Um, and then there are other programs on interpersonal relationships and how to have healthy relationships and what an unhealthy relationship might look like. And then how to activate the services, how to understand or how to, how to work with a person like Kevin Anderson, who's the director of player engagement, what his function is, explaining all that to them as part of this curricula. And then for the players who are more veteran or senior, we have professional development. So there's a professional development opportunity that's required. Some teams have others that are not mandatory, but because the players are interested and want to participate. And sometimes those might look like player, former player panels and maybe former players who've transitioned well, former players who did not transition well, and allowing for the active veterans as well as the younger players to really communicate back and forth with them about you know, what were the stumbling blocks that you had? How did you overcome them? How were you able to be successful? How do you build a resume? So we, we talk about a lot of different things that sometimes people like yourself and myself, since we're lawyers, we would have already built our resume when we were in college, mm -hmm. then going into law school. For a lot of our players, they're learning while they're on the job because the average age is 22 when they're coming into the National Football League. We also were with, work with Lee Heck Harrison, um, and they assist players with resume building as well as interviewing skills and techniques and how to present themselves when they're um, working with, uh, say, a Fortune 500 company. Because oftentimes the players, are transi they're, pl they're transitioning from college into a professional environment, maybe not have had those types of experience on a regular basis. So the whole concept of how to communicate effectively when you're talking to an owner of a Fortune 500 company is not something that they're going to have received in a class. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we know oftentimes players will go into broadcasting. What mm -hmm. other uh, fields in law or medicine 
uh, politics to the players uh, go into as well? The full spectrum. I, I, there was one young man who currently plays now who um, during his off season, so during February, March, April, he, w he wants to own his own franchise. So he worked at a store, a shoe store, because he wanted to learn the business from the ground up. So we have the full spectrum of interest, just like you know anybody else. We have lawyers, we've got doctors, we've got architects, we have people in the music industry, we have people that love to cook, that also happen to love to play football. We have artists, we have um, um, performers. I mean, the, the full spectrum. For 25 years, the Massachusetts School of Law has been training great lawyers and building great relationships. Joining MSL was more than just making friends, it was becoming a part of a family, which makes it very difficult to leave. I don't want to leave MSL. We didn't want to leave MSL ever! Best decision ever! We love MSL, we don't want to leave. The Massachusetts School of Law. Great lawyers, better people. Come join our family. Visit us today at mslaw.edu. Jeez, get some glasses, ref. Yes, the job looks real easy from where we sit. But how do those guys, and for now, it's just guys, get started? Dean Blandino started out as an intern in 1994 for the NFL officiating department right out of college. In 2013, he became vice president of officiating. Here's Dean Blandino. We have, a, we have an extensive scouting program, and we have regional scouts all over the country and we actually go out and we scout lower level games, high school games, lower level college games, and we recruit younger officials and we bring them into our scouting program. Once they're in our program, then we monitor their progress. And we have what's called an advanced development program. And so once those officials get to a certain point where we feel that they're ready to take the next step, we bring them into that program. They actually um, work NFL preseason games. They go to training camps off-season uh, training activities, things like that, so we can get a closer look at them, mm -hmm. and they can get a feel for what NFL officiating is about, the speed of the game, the rules of the game, and then we have a group of 21 officials that are in our advanced development program, and that's the group that we, when we have openings in the league, we pull from that group uh, to, to go into the NFL. In the uh, officials that you are scouting, is there women among them? Because after all, we women, you know, we buy your apparel, we watch your game, and we're not likely to play on your field. Absolutely. You, we, have, we have several women in our pipeline. We have a lot uh -huh. of women that are officiating football, and we have several that are, at, that are moving to the top level. We have one, Sarah Thomas, who's in our advanced development program. She's a, she's a college official right now in Conference USA, and so she's at the top of our scouting program. Wow. So Sarah if she continues to develop, to develop, we'll have a pretty good chance of getting into the NFL pretty soon. So we, we do have a lot of female officials, and that's an initiative to try and, and go out and find women um, that are interested in football, and hey, maybe officiating could be a career path. Women would love to see that, so yeah. congratulations on that. Discuss officiating the Sunday game. What is that like? Well, officiating the Sunday game, I think if you asked any of our officials, the three hours from kickoff to the end of the game, are, are that's the best part of what they do. There's so much other stuff, the preparation sure. and the training and the film study, but those three hours, it's, it's like that's their sanctuary. And there's a lot going on. There's a lot of stuff that they have to manage, not just in between the whistles, but with TV, with game operations right. and all of that stuff. So it kind of comes together. There's a lot of preparation, but the three hours, um, that's the fun part. How do you attempt to ensure consistency among calls? Consistency, that's the magic word. That's if you talk to coaches, players, fans, officials, we all want consistency from game to game, from official to official, from crew to crew. So it's through communication, film study, um, and, and really what we do, our overall evaluation, evaluation process, and it starts here in this office. And so if we're consistent in, if, in how we evaluate our officials, then they will go out and hopefully officiate the game consistent, consistently. So there's a lot of things that go into it, but that's how my main goal is, is certainly consistency because we're going to make mistakes. It happens, but we have to be able to learn from those mistakes and make sure we don't repeat them as we go forward. 
Discuss, if you would, ethnic diversity in officiating and how that might contribute to at least perceived consistency, if not, in fact, real consistency. Sure. So, so ethnic diversity, diversity is a core value of the NFL, and it's something that we take very seriously in officiating. So we're always looking for um, officials from diverse backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of candidates coming through the ranks, whether it's min minority officials um, that we try to um, – train and, and bring into the league when they're ready. Now we want, it's a balance, we want the best officials, but right. we also want a, a diverse group of officials. Um, I don't think there's any difference in terms of, or a perceived difference in terms of performance um, in that within that group. I think it's something we look at our, our entire staff, our 119 officials, and when we're talking about consistency, we want them uh, to to officiate to the same to the same level. We want them to officiate under the same guidelines. So I really don't think there's a perceived or or a real difference in consistency. But but diversity is is very important to us and, and one of our priorities. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Besides the players and coaches, officials are your most visible people on the field. Do they tend to develop big egos, and if so, how do you deal with that? That's a great question. We we. We have actually where we run into that a little bit is with our referees, our head referees, because they are the face of the crew. They're making the announcement. Um, so most of our referees are, are great. Everybody has a little bit of an ego. You get to that point, you're a successful person. Uh, you probably have a little bit of an ego. Uh, but officiating, the best officials are neither seen nor heard. The best officiated game is when you, you don't even realize they're out there. Mm -hmm. So we certainly have that balance. We want officials to be ambassadors for the league. And that's important. So when they're out there, uh, they they put their best foot forward and present well. Uh, but we also don't want them to be center of attention because if officiating is the center of attention, that's not a good thing. <laughs> we are here, as you've alluded to, in your beautiful NFL command center here in New yeah. York. Much different than what I would have anticipated. Look at all these chairs and TVs. Explain what goes on here on a Sunday. Yeah, this is this is really the nerve center of the NFL on Sunday. So we're monitoring every game that's going on. We're watching the, the TV broadcast. We're listening in to the announcers. I'm here, and I can monitor all the different games. I can get a heads up on what's happening if there's a controversial play, if there's a significant injury, if there's something that I know I'm going to have to address during the week. I've already got a leg up because I've seen it happen live, and I and I can start to gather the information. We have two-way communication with the networks, so if the, the announcers are saying something and maybe they're misinterpreting a rule, I can get on the phone and communicate directly with the TV network okay. to, to explain to them the, the proper interpretation, wow. and then they can hopefully correct themselves on the air. One of the things that I would imagine presents a real problem for you is people now sitting in their living rooms on the couch with their high definition TVs they have a great view of the game so they think they can make the calls right there from the living room so is that some of the reason instant replay came about and how do you deal with the home quarterback and the home officials absolutely so technology has certainly driven a lot of what we've done in officiating as technology gets better um, the bar raises and and so you have the home experience is so much better than it was 20 sure. years ago high definition and multiple angles and all the analysis that they're getting and so the scrutiny on on officiating is that much more and we have to keep up with that so certainly with the advent of instant replay we're trying to stay on the cutting edge of technology and we're trying to get the calls right and we're going to use technology to do that and that's why our replay system has advanced to where it is where we're using high def te right. technology we're using multiple angles sure and so we're trying to have the, the fan at home see the same thing that the officials are seeing under the hood and so we can both come to the to the same conclusion hopefully that's the right conclusion and if there ultimately is some call that tends to be controversial and is picked up by the news media. Um, how do you communicate what's gone on behind the scenes to the media and to the public? Sure. Well, the first thing, and we've really taken a, a stance on being transparent. Now, if there's, if there's a mistake that's made, we want to step up and be accountable for that. But we also want to educate in terms of, okay, here's the rule. Here, here's what right. the official is looking at. Here's what his perspective is. And then explain if it is a mistake, here's why, here's why the error occurred, here's what should have happened. So we analyze everything, and then the big thing is coming out and saying, okay, we did make a mistake, here's why, and try to educate people as to the entire process. Because it's, it's very easy to sit after the fact and analyze the different angles and say, well, that was an incorrect call. But in the moment, the official, he has one look at it, 
full speed. It happens very quickly, and he has to make a decision. So sometimes mistakes happen, and we, we want to be accountable when they do. What are some of the major misconceptions that the general public has about instant replay? I think the biggest one is that the referee has different angles than what everybody's seeing at home. Okay. And it was really important when we put the system in to say, we don't want to make decisions based on angles that everybody at home doesn't see. And so we're looking at the same information so that we don't have a situation where we make a decision and everybody at home is wondering why. We took it a step further last year where we actually show the under the hood feed so that the angles that the referee is looking at, we show that in the stadium during the review so the fans in the stadium can actually see why the decision is made. So I think that's the biggest misconception that we have secret angles or cameras <laughs> hidden somewhere. It's all the network cameras and it's all the stuff that's going out over the air to the people at home. Several coaches went on the field during the season last year, which I understand is a violation of the rules. How do you sanction those coaches and do you sanction the coaches? Yeah, well, we do, we do. We work with the coaches every week. Our crews work with the, with the team to say the sideline, that white area, that's for the game officials and the coaches okay. need to stay out of that. Sure. Every team actually has what's called a get back coach. And that get back coach is a coach that's responsible. That I'm going to go to the get back coach and say, hey, coach, you have to get everybody back. And he's responsible then for communicating that to the team and the coaches. So um, when they do, if something happens where a coach or a player gets onto the field and interferes with the, with the play, mm -hmm. um, there's a penalty that, that can be assessed, which is called a palpably unfair act. There could be potential discipline in terms of fines to the coach or the team. So that's something we address on a case-by-case -case basis when it, when it happens, which is, which is very rare, but it has happened. For a whole month during the season, we see some of the biggest, baddest dudes out there dressed in their pink. How did that come about? Well, I think it's an initiative. The NFL has several initiatives, the Breast Cancer Awareness, right. Salute to Service. And, and so I think it's a, it's, it was just a natural fit. It's such a great cause. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a visible, you know, with the pink, it's so visible. I mean, we had our officials decked out in pink. We had pink whistles, pink flags last year. Uh, so there are a lot of initiatives like that, great causes that the NFL, that the NFL takes, uh, takes a part in, and, that, and that's one of them. And it's real important, the work you do. You support a lot of causes, and Absolutely. as a member of the public, we applaud the NFL for your high morals and for doing things like that. It's a wonderful thing. This past January in Forbes magazine, a contributor wrote an article entitled, 28 Years of Getting It Wrong. Is the NFL really getting it mostly right and seldom getting it wrong? Whenever you notice officiating, it's when there's a mistake. And, yeah. and that's, why the, that's why the profile is so much higher now. And so when there's a good call, people really don't talk about it. And when you look at our overall percentage of accuracy, it's been the last couple of years about 98%. And if you're 98% good at something that you do, that's, that's pretty that's good. That's pretty darn good. But when we do make a mistake, people will harp on it. So I think we are getting it right. I think there's room for improvement. And consistency is certainly an area that we're going to continue to work on. Uh, but I, I would disagree with that, that. One of the things the article talked about was the Western Championship game. And again, I think it's fans don't really understand which plays are and which plays are not reviewable. So I wonder if, in fact, you might take a few minutes and tell us just briefly what plays can't be reviewed. Like in that particular case, you had a player at the at the goal line, mm -hmm. and there was a controversy over that, but that wasn't reviewable. It wasn't reviewable. That, that was the... Uh, a fumble was ruled on the field, and who recovered that fumble is not a reviewable play, was not a reviewable play at that time. Mm -hmm. That rule has since um, proposed to be changed to make it a reviewable oh, play. Wow. The, 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 in the institution of replay, the competition committee felt that we wanted to deal in fact, not, not, a, not a subjective call. So did the ball hit the ground? Did the foot touch the sideline? Was the knee down? Not whether is that enough restriction for holding. So. What's reviewable is things that involve possession of, a, of, of the football, the boundary lines, the sideline, the goal line, the end line. But when you're talking about pure subjective calls, holding, pass interference, mm -hmm. those are not reviewable. Some fans prefer that an official make the call because they like the thrill of error. Um, is that something you folks considered? I think that's something that we have seen. That's feedback that we have because in the original replay system, it was the official up in the booth right. that was making the decision, and you really didn't know who that person was. So when we put replay back in, it was important to say, no, 
Here's the referee. He's in charge of the crew. He's going to make this decision. So it, it just gives a credibility factor to the entire process. So that, that is important, and we have heard that. Have you considered going to a more centralized call similar to the NHL? We're, we're looking at that. We're mm -hmm. looking at the feasibility of that. We feel that that has some merit in terms of consistency and standardizing um, the decision-making process. So that's in the, it's in the, the, the working mode right now. We're not sure if we're going to head that direction, but it's something we're considering. What is the ro most rewarding part of your job personally? I think personally, it doesn't happen very often, but when, when you do get a call and say, hey, the, the crew worked a really good game. And, and we're, in officiating, we're responsible for upholding the integrity of the game, making sure the game is played fairly, the outcome is, is, is decided fairly, and that the players are safe, that the game is safe for the players. And so that's rewarding when you have a little part of that. And you can say, hey, I, I've got a little part of making sure the game is played fairly and played safely. Uh, that's the most rewarding part for me. I wonder if you might comment on the recent settlement between the league and the Players Association and how head injuries are going to be dealt with going forward and how does that impact officiating? Well, in officiating, we really didn't have anything to do with the settlement, but our job in officiating, and this, this goes back for as long as there have been game officials, we're, we're the first responders on the field. Yeah. And it's really important, and we've really harped with our game officials to understand that if we see a player in distress, a, a player that could be potentially injured, whether it's a potential head injury or any body part, that we need to stop the game and get that player attention. So that's been the direction, that's been the directive to our game officials, and we've, we, we're very, we feel very strongly about that, that, hey, regardless of the situation in the game, if there's a player that has been injured or potentially injured, we need to stop the game and get that player, get that player uh, attended to. So that's where we come in in that whole process. How are you going to deal with racial slurs on the field going forward? Well, I think we have our current rule covers any language that's abusive, threatening, or insulting. So that would that would include anything of a racial nature, a, a sexual orientation nature. Okay. So our current rules cover that, and and when it's in an aggressive, insulting manner, that's when offic officials are empowered to throw flags for taunting and unsportsmanlike. So there's really no change. Okay. It's going to be a point of emphasis, and we're gonna and we're gonna when it is used in that manner, that that it will result in a flag. What changes do you forecast for the next 10 years in the NFL as it pertains to officiating? I think we're going to look at using technology to, to enhance performance. Next year, we're going to go to uh, an official-to-official -official communication system where all the officials on the crew can communicate wirelessly in a, in a closed network. So now, um, oh. if I'm 30 yards away, I don't have to use hand signals or run over to you. We can communicate. And I think that will really help us. So I think we're going to use technology, um, whether it's on the field, whether it's in replay, or in this room in our evaluation process. I think that's probably something that's going to continue to change as we look to make enhancements. Massachusetts School of Law. Legal education that is practical, accessible, affordable, and enjoyable. Offering flexible day and evening classes, full or part-time studies, where candidates are assessed not on the LSAT, but their academic and other accomplishments. Providing more professional skills training than any other law school in New England. Massachusetts School of Law. Visit us at mslaw.edu. Training students to become successful lawyers and advocates, not just legal scholars. you know who the first African-American referee in the NFL was? You will. He was an NFL official for 23 years. I was raised in, in Washington, D.C., and part of the physical ed curriculum in eighth grade was basketball officiating. So I started there, and I was the manager of the basketball team. Manager being the person who normally handles all the equipment, and also I was responsible for the uh, official score. But at the same time, I was being taught how to officiate basketball, and I kind of handled all the scrimmages for the basketball team. I went from junior high to high school, and there I was also the manager of the basketball team, and I, again, worked all the scrimmages for the basketball mm -hmm. team. So when I graduated from high school, I went into the Air Force, and I went to join the local group in Shreveport, Louisiana, as a basketball official, and at that time, they were short of football officials. So God talked me into doing it, and I went from there. I, I started, I worked my first high school 
football game at age 18, which is not normal. That's not normal. And then my first college game, I worked when I was 22. Again, not normal. And from there, I just kind of went from there. Got lucky. Incredible story. Well, I think it was more than luck. My next question is, you spent 23 years as an official in the NFL, and you were the first black referee, as I understand it. Tell us about how that transition happened. Well, when I first came into the league, each year at our clinic in uh, Dallas, they always ask if you had an opportunity to change positions, what position you'd like to change to. And I always filled out the card, uh, referee. Number one, to me, it's the easiest position on the field. You just babysit a quarterback. Uh, and then in 1980, I believe it was 1988, uh, Art McNally, who was the supervisor at that time, called me and asked me if I was ready to make the move. And I jumped at it, yes, indeed. <laughs> so we went from there. Who were some of your early mentors? And share with us any conversation or guidance they provided you along the way. Well, when I came back to D.C. after uh, leaving the Air Force, uh, a guy named Tom Beard took me under his wing and kind of guided me, made sure I stayed on the straight and narrow as far as college officiating was concerned. Uh, when I came in, was accepted into the league in 1981, I was put on Jim Tunney's crew for the first four years and I think that's one of the best things that could have happened to me because at that time he was the premier referee in the league. He was a uh, ex-superintendent of schools in Los Angeles. He's a motivational speaker so I kind of picked up a lot of things from him and my temperament and his temperament kind of meshed and then af after the four years with Jim I was with uh, Dick Jorgensen. Again his temperament was similar to, to Jim's. He's, he was a bank president, so, you know, straight and narrow there, too. We hope. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. No, no shenanigans there. And it, those two just kind of set the way that I like to run a crew. They weren't overbearing. Everybody knew they were in charge without, without showing it. Without being overbearing? Yes, yes. I guess that's a nice way of putting it, yes. How diverse is officiating today? Well, when I first came to the league, I think we had uh, nine black officials. And I took a look at the roster this morning. I, we've got 33 wow. black officials now. Oh, that's great yes, news. Yes, yes. You are recognized as a very important historical figure. How do you wish to be remembered in history? I'd like to be remembered by my cohorts as someone they want to walk on the field with on Sunday afternoon. Now, history, I can't deal with that. Uh, somebody had to be first. <laughs> <laughs> and it was wonderful that it was you, because oh, well, you are a terrific role model. Well, thank you. What are the risks of injury to officials? The biggest one is getting run over, getting too close to a play, not recognizing when it's time to back away. Uh, we get a lot of guys that get their knees wiped out. The other things are just minor uh, tears, stretches, and those kind of nagging injuries. But the biggest thing is the, the knees and the legs, getting too close to the play, uh, getting rolled up on, on the sideline, uh, trying to back out, and you back into your chain crew, and they're, not, <laughs> they're in your way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, you got hurt officiating, is that correct, or was it off the field? No, it was a crazy situation. We were up in, uh, near, uh, what was the name of it? Buffalo. I'm just trying a long pass downfield. I'm just jogging downfield, and I felt something oh and didn't know what it was. Went down. Now we're coming back the other way. I, again, I'm just trotting up the field, and I snapped my del what is it, deltoid ligament in my ankle. So, And they had to do reconstruction surgery. Oh, my. That. Did you have to get carried off the field? Uh, well, didn't care. I, walk, I was able to walk off Good. the field. I, I, I sat on the sideline for a while, and... Uh, my back judge at that time was uh, Scott Green, and he came over and said, hey, man, I need your white hat. <laughs> <laughs> Different question. What position do you occupy now, and are you in a position that you still continue to effectuate positive change within the NFL? We have four regional supervisors in, in the NFL office, and I'm the Northeast Regional, regional Supervisor. I'm responsible for the, uh, the Redskins, the Ravens, Philadelphia, the Jets, Giants, and Buffalo.
Not our beloved Patriots? Not, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I mentioned, yes, New England. I forgot New England, New England. yes, okay. yes, New Don't England, yes, us. yes. Explain the milestones that have occurred within the NFL with respect to race relations. Milestones? The, well, the one that I remember right offhand was 1965 when Burl Toler became the first black official in the league. Mm -hmm. uh, then we had, and I was lucky to be a part of this, 1988, Washington, Denver. Yes. Uh, Doug Williams, the first black in the Super Bowl. I was hoping you would tell yeah, that yeah. story. What is it like to officiate in the Super Bowl? Once you realize you've gotten the assignment, it, it kind of takes on the shape of any other game. I, it, at least it did for me. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to stay focused. That's the same one thing. How does one stay focused when you have players in your face, you might have management or coaches in your face questioning calls, and your goal has to be to stay cool and focused. How do you do that? Well, that's why you don't just come straight from high school into the NFL. <laughs> it takes a while to get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just training. It's like any other job. You, you get used to it. You're starting out with Pop Warner, where the only people there bothering you are the parents. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you go from there to high school. Now you get the players and the coaches involved. And then college, it becomes more coaches than anything else. Uh, you get used to it. It's just like being a policeman. Number one, you know you're not going to please everybody on every call. I, can I say this? You're going to piss somebody. 50% <laughs> of the time, you're going to piss somebody <laughs> off, all right? Oh, you're not doing your job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's just the way it is. That, yeah. that goes with the territory. The NFL is a major successful business. In my opinion, it's one with a moral compass. Discuss how that either helps the game or hinders the game. One thing that we strive is to have integrity among the officials. Mm -hmm. We, by, you, by them being graded every play of every game, we want to keep any appearance of impropriety out of it. We, you can tell when a person is, well, since I've never had this problem, and, and as far as I, the 34 years I've been in the league, I don't remember having it, when somebody's cheating. Mm -hmm. And that, if, if you grade it every play, somebody's looking over your shoulder on every play, it's kind of hard to do that because tendencies will start to, to come out. Sure. Yeah. Who grades and who reviews the, the uh, we officials? Have, we have the four regional supervisors, and we have four uh, associate supervisors who grade every, every game, every play. Are there penalties for missed calls or bad performance? Well, that's when you don't go to the playoffs. Yeah, yeah right. that, okay, that's, that's, that's the That's the end result, yeah. And poor calls over an extended period of time will get you released. The officials on year-to-year -year contracts. What advice do you have to aspiring young children who dream of being an official in the NFL? Even at the young age, nobody ever thinks about being an official. So when I go out and talk to... Uh, high school kids, younger kids, I, I, I tell them there is an opportunity to stay close to the game because even players, right now I just came up from a, a camp we're having down in Baltimore. We've got 25 ex-players there. We're, we're exposing them to officiating this weekend. They, all of them, to each to a man, have said they never thought about officiating. All, when they were players, they, all they wanted to do was curse at us. <laughs> <laughs> And we're, this weekend, we're exposing them to, to officiating to see whether or not this is something they want to do. And if it is something they want to do, we're going to help them in their local areas, get attached to uh, their local high school groups, and hopefully they can go from there. But normally, kids don't think about officiating. Yeah. They want to be players. Sure they do. Yeah. Except their parents don't want them to play well, and football. I've, and it's good, it's good when parents are there when we're talking to them yeah. because we talk to the parents to tell them, there's a way to stay close to the football game without being a player and not getting hurt. In 1988, Greer officiated in Super Bowl 22, which was his last game as a field judge. It was the same game in which Super Bowl MVP Doug Williams became the first African-American quarterback to lead his team to victory in the Super Bowl. Well, that's it from here. Now let the games begin. Thanks to the NFL, the Patriots, and everyone for participating. Thank you for joining us. We hope you learned a few things. Never stop learning.